Greetings. Welcome to Cleveland Community Chapel. Thanks for joining us. Joining us tonight for our Old Testament studies. We're studying in Zechariah chapter 9. We've made it to Zechariah the prophet to the returning exiles. It's kind of what we are here at church now. We're opening back up slowly. We're open on uh, Sunday morning for worship and we're open on Wednesday evening for a New Testament study. We're still doing Sunday night as online only to keep enough time between the, when we're in and out of the building. So, if you got your Bible with you, we can begin in chapter 9, verse 1. Zechariah's prophecy says, The burden of the word of the Lord in the land of Hadrach and Damascus when shall be the rest thereof when the eyes of man... As of all the tribes of Israel shall be toward the Lord. It's just a way of saying, here's a prophecy that's looking way out there in the future when all eyes are on the Lord. That's, we're not living there yet. That's still in front of us, ain't it? And Hamath shall be bordered thereby, and Tyrus and Sidon, or Tyre and Sidon. Jesus talked about these because judgment came upon them later, and though it be very wise. And here Zechariah is going to talk about it. It's in the future for Zechariah. Jesus looked back at it in the past. And he said, Tyrus, or Tyre, did build herself a stronghold and heaped up silver as dust and fine gold as the mire of the streets. Now, if you're heaping up silver like dust and gold's like the mud in the streets, you're rich, right? So he said, Tyre built herself a stronghold. And, and this is in the future for Zechariah. This is prophecy. And it was really going good. Boy, they were a center of commercial activity because uh, the old city had been destroyed and they decided to go out here on an island and they built a new city and it got to going good and man, it was, seemed like it was uh, an uncon unconquerable city out there in the, in the bay like that in, that in that island. But Alexander the Great comes and Alexander the Great figures out a way to siege the city and he takes the rubble from the old city and they build a causeway over months and they just keep building that causeway out from the mainland to the island until they can come in with their armies and destroy it. And that's the next verse here. Even though they were doing so well, behold, the Lord will cast her out and he'll smite her power in the sea and she'll be devoured with fire. <laughs> and all that came to pass and Jesus referred to that judgment in the New Testament. Now he's going to mention Philistine cities. Ashkelon shall see it and fear. Gaza will see it and be very sorrowful. And Ekron, all Philistine cities, for her expect expectation shall be ashamed. And the king shall perish from Gaza and Ashkelon shall not be inhabited. And a bastard will dwell in Ashdod. He's just saying, only people left going to be low lowlifes living over there. And I'll cut off the pride of the Philistines. That's what always gets us human beings in trouble. We get so prideful. And that's, that's where we're at here in America, too. We ain't learned our lesson yet. You know, this, this virus stuff ain't through. We ain't learned our lesson yet. We ain't learned to love one another. We ain't learned to be kind to one another. We haven't learned to do unto others as we'd have them do unto us. All you got to do is turn the news on every night and see that's true. And and you say, well, well, why would the judgment be over with to us then uh, but uh, when we get arrogant, we get, and, and you know what causes it? We get blessed too much. When we get blessed so much, we forget about where the blessings come from. And God has to allow us to be humbled again. And that's what happened all through history here in the Old Testament. It happened to Israel over and over again. They, you know, they were God's people, but they'd be so blessed, they'd forget about where the blessings come from. And God would have to allow some conquering army or some plague or pestilence or famine or something would come in they'd put them back on their knees but you know what happened they'd get back on their knees and they'd realize man we better turn back to God and things would, would be good for a period of time and and Zechariah is looking way out in history and in the future is history and and we see it as history but he looks into the future and says uh, that pattern don't stop it just keeps going they got prideful and God had to, had to humble them, the Philistines and the Tyre and Sidon and Israel and everybody. Verse 7, I'll, I'll take away his blood out of his mouth and his abominations from between his teeth. But he that remains, 
even he shall be for our God. In other words, God says there'll be a remnant survive this judgment, and they'll realize that we better turn back to God. He that remains, that remnant, they'll be for God, and, and he'll be as a governor in Judah or a leader in Ekron as a, as a Jebusite. And now, in the near future for Zechariah, I think this a lot of this applies to Alexander the Great and his conquering the world. Remember, he, he died, I think, at the age of 29 as an alcoholic, and he died crying that there were no more worlds to conquer. He just went through taking everything. But the Israelites, having just returned, built this temple back in the process of building it back in Zechariah's time. They're probably uh, going to get to the point that says, man, we just got that temple built back a few years ago, and here comes old Alexander the Great, and he's going to tear it down, and it's just destruction in his, in his path. But God promises to the ones building it in that day, yeah, there'll be destruction coming out there in the future, but I'm going to keep my hand on my house. He's not going to destroy that. I will encamp about my house because of the army, because of him that passes by. And because of him that returns, and no oppressor shall pass through them anymore. For now I have seen with mine eyes. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He's just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt the foal of an ass. Now this is prophetic, but you've probably heard those every Palm Sunday that it was applied to Jesus in the New Testament. When he come into Jerusalem that last week that we call Holy Week now, he came back riding on that donkey. Sometimes you think that was just a symbol of his humbleness, but no, that wasn't really the humbleness because the donkey was uh, is what kings rode when they were in a, a peace mission. If they were coming back to make war, they'd be coming riding back on usually a big white horse as Jesus is coming back in the future to make war on those that know not God. But when he come that first time into Jerusalem, he was coming to make peace. He was going to give his own life as a sacrifice for us that we could have peace in our hearts. The king comes, he's just. They say the, the chant you see on the news and the writers and the protesters right now is no justice, no peace, no justice, no peace, no justice, right? And there's truth to that. There wouldn't be any peace in your heart, Christian, if there wasn't for the justice of God. See, the justice of God was not directed on you. It was directed on Christ, on Calvary's cross. Therefore, God's justice has been satisfied, and there can be peace in your heart because your king came. He's our king, ain't he? And I'll cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem and the battle bow will be cut off. Now, the chariot, the horse, and the battle bow. If those are done away with, those are all instruments of war. It's just a way of God saying, I'll have peace will come. And they'll speak peace unto the heathen. That would be us, non-Jews. We were called the heathen back then because we were people that didn't know God. But if you don't know the Lord today, then you're a heathen in God's eyes. But peace is available to you because the king came and satisfied God's justice. And his dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. It'll be a, a worldwide peace is available. As for thee also, by the blood of thy covenant, I've sent forth thy prisoners out of the pit wherein is no water. Now we'll make this in a spiritual interpretation here. Jesus, when he offered the Lord's Supper, it was actually a Passover sacrifice that last night in the upper room that melted into the Lord's Supper, and he, he gave the cup, and he said, this is my blood of the new covenant. He was going to shed his blood that next day on that Friday, wasn't he? By the blood of the covenant, I sent forth the prisoners out of the pit wherein is no water, because Jesus shed his blood we're set free. We don't have to go to the pit wherein there is no water. That's a way of describing hell. We're now prisoners, but we're prisoners of hope, he says. Turn you to the stronghold, you prisoners of hope. 
Hope's a good thing, isn't it? Saddest thing in the world is an atheist funeral where there's no hope. Even today do I declare that I will render double unto thee. I'm going to bless you like you can't believe. When I've bent Judah for me and filled the bow with Ephraim, I filled the bow with Ephraim and bent Judah. He says, they're going to be, they're going to be on my side. They're going to be what I'm going to use to conquer here. When I bent Judah for me and filled the bow with Ephraim and raised up your sons, O Zion, against thy sons, O Greece, and made thee as a sword of a mighty man. There's going to be a time where God's people's going to have no enemies. That's still in front of us. And the Lord will be seen over them. Even though this is prophetic, still out in the future in front of us, God's people still, ought to, the world ought to look at the church and see the Lord over them. The Lord will be seen over them. He's going to be seen in a visible way when he comes back, though. And I think that's what verse 14 is talking about. It's looking all the way up to the second coming here. The Lord will be seen over them, and his arrows will go forth as the lightning. And the Lord shall blow the trumpet. Now, when we read the New Testament verses about the second coming, it's like he, Jesus said, I'll, I'll go from one end of the heavens to the other as the lightning from the east to the west. And the trumpet will blow, and he'll go with the whirlwinds of the south, and the Lord of hosts shall defend them. Our God will fight for us, and, and they'll devour and subdue with sling stones, and they'll drink and make a noise as through wine, and they'll be filled like bowls as the corners of the altar. And the Lord their God shall save them in that day. And usually when you're reading the prophets and you run across the verse, in that day, it's looking way out to the day of the Lord. He'll save them in that day as the flock of his people. The Lord is my shepherd. I want to be part of the flock of his people. And if you're part of that flock, they'll be as the stones of a crown. Precious. Lifted up as an inside upon, uh, on his land. It'll be like a flag flying over the land. For how great is his goodness. God's good all the time. All the time God's good. How great is his goodness and how great is his beauty. Corn shall make the young men cheerful and the new wine the maids. In that day, it's going to be a cheerful time, he said. When we have no enemies and the last enemy to be conquered is death, the New Testament says. That's still out in front of us, but Zechariah saw it by faith and inspiration long, long ago. We'll see you next week. We'll do chapter 10. God bless you. Amen.